History of the Church. I'm Jonathan McCormick. And I'm Adam Christman. An Oral History of the Church is a conversational church history podcast coming from a Christian historiographic perspective, discussing subjects by volume or season. On this podcast, we consider history an art form. Let's get started. Well, Jonathan, last time we tried to wrap up our worldview episodes, we began with a discussion of uh, four large schools of thought, and then last time was our discussion of Christian or biblical historiography. Uh, So to recap this most recent one very quickly, biblical historiography essentially divides into two umbrellas, two camps, two methods for operating with the text as historical documents. One is minimalism, where the historian will minimize or find minimal use for elements of uh, supernatural intervention or other miraculous events or descriptions. Uh, Exactly. The minimalist will approach the text uh, with a hermeneutic of suspicion or doubt. Now, on the other side of the discussion are the maximalists, which is where you and I sit for the perhaps random listener who doesn't know us personally. (laughs) If Um, so, welcome to the podcast. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Um. Maximalists will treat the biblical texts as earnest, honest attempts to represent what happened in each event, in the life of each person that is uh, documented in some way in that text. So if the scriptures say that um, Jesus fed 5,000 people with the five loaves of bread and the two fish. We seek to understand it with a a hermeneutic of belief or a hermeneutic of trust, where we're trying to, we attempt to trust that the author is telling us the truth at least as best as he or she understands it. So this will treat supernatural events or descriptions or persons in the biblical texts as legitimate points of data for historical work regarding biblical history um, or church history, early church history. Um, Do you think I've summarized those well enough? Or would you add anything? There is one thing I would add, and this was a bit of a fascinating thing for me. Uh, At SBL, uh, uh, the Society of Biblical Literature, I encountered some historical minimalists. Uh, They uh, they would be that way from uh, a biblical encountering the biblical text, Mm -hmm. but they also seemed to be minimalists in terms of the other ancient Near Eastern documents. Mm -hmm. Um, So. You have the Moabite uh, stela, which is crediting Baal. Uh, They are unlikely to see um, miraculous or supernatural things credited to Baal as having occurred either, as well as, you know, the God of the Bible and uh, Jesus in the New Testament. Yeah. So when we come at these and talk about worldview on even a broader perspective than just historiography, we we can turn to discussing a divide between a materialist or a materialism worldview and an anti-materialist or an anti-materialism worldview. Now, these terms are horrible. These are not good terms for the worldviews. <laughs> they don't really capture what they mean in a single word. They really don't. Um, the materialists are not uh, 
Um, it's not a school of thought. It's not a worldview populated entirely by 1980s Madonna, um, that material <laughs> girl in a material world. It's not about that at all. Uh, it's rather a worldview, whether functional, let's say for a scientist, uh, a geologist or a biologist, or actual philosophically for I had a I had a philosophy professor for an exterior uh, seminar that I took in my doctorate who is a materialist and philosophically he is a materialist uh, materialists insist that the only thing that exists is matter not that anyone can define what matter is very well, but they say only that which is material is real. Only that which is material can be observed and uh, have hypotheses tested against it. Um, so there, there is nothing else. Now again, that can be functional. So a Christian scientist who's a geologist... Um, could be a functional materialist because a geologist doesn't study the nature of God. A geologist gets really study. good at studying rocks. So, um, functionally speaking, you can have materialists, and that's neither here nor there. That's a methodology choice. Um, but when it's when it's a philosophical standpoint, these these um, materialists insist that supernatural events cannot occur, that there cannot be supernatural elements, no resurrection of the dead, uh, no miraculous healings. Uh, there's nothing in the universe that cannot eventually be explained through the study of matter, through the scientific method. Even if we can't explain it now, that we will someday be able to explain everything that has ever been attributed to something supernatural. We just don't have the right tools yet. Exactly. The anti-materialist worldview is the flip side of that coin. This is a philosophical standpoint that a spiritual or supernatural reality does exist in some fashion. And usually that means that the supernatural or the spiritual can intersect with the material. So the material plane, uh, human beings like you and I can experience, can see or hear or touch something or someone that is affected by something supernatural. So an anti-materialist can look at the accounts of the life of Jesus and say, yeah, sure, uh, that, that, that kid got he resurrected from the dead or that, that woman got healed or whatever. Uh, that, could, that could potentially happen, yes. And there's, that's a whole umbrella within, uh, within its own side of the discussion because anti-materialists range from Christians all the way to uh, Buddhists and uh, Muslims and so on and so forth. Anti-materialists are anyone who sees... Uh, the the idea of the supernatural as necessary to our existence. Exactly. So these are these are the the worldviews that often come to immediate um, play within minimalist and maximalist conversations. Uh, some of the difficulty is when the two camps interact is speaking on the same level, allowing for the other person's um, point to be made within their perspective and, um, and trying to come to the best understanding together rather than um, what has sometimes been the case where one will shut out the other simply because, oh, well, you're a maximalist. That means you're an idiot. Or, uh, well, you're a minimalist. That means I don't have to listen to anything you say. 
Well, no, uh, we can learn from each other in in many areas of life, but in history, in history writing, minimalists and maximalists can learn from each other. In fact, we won't deal with it this time. We should probably deal with it sometime before we end this uh, this season, this volume. There are some times where it is useful and helpful to make sure you have someone from a maximalist position um, checking a minimalist work, minimalist checking a maximalist position, because sometimes we find a discovery that is too good to be true, and then we find out it is. <laughs> uh, a, an artifact, a book, a letter... Mm -hmm. Some data point of history uh, built specifically to fit with the biases and preconceptions of your worldview. And sometimes it helps to have someone who doesn't have those biases say, hey, that that looks like it's forged. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. Uh, for example, a, a recent conversation has been about the gospel of Jesus' wife. Uh, if it were a, an authentic document, that would have been a somewhat fascinating find to understand a, an early Gnostic group. Right. Uh, but I cut you off. No, it's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Maximalists generally... Uh, Asked for verification. Okay, well, let's see if this is a legitimate document from history past as opposed to a modern forgery. Many uh, minimalists, I would say more lay, lay persons interested in history, um, yeah. saw it a little bit more as a, a gotcha data point. See, nothing is as clean as you want it to be. There were many minimalists who said, well, let's wait and see, just like the maximalists did. And um, I'm grateful for them as well, of course. Um, and it did turn out that this was just a modern forgery that was an attempt to make a quick buck. And the thing that was the evidence was we really didn't have a chain all the way back to its discovery. It just mm -hmm. sort of pops up. Right. Anyway, so that's our um, recap of minimalism and maximalism and uh, more of a detail. We've mentioned materialism and anti-materialism, and we wanted to get good description of those out there in this volume to accompany them. But Jonathan, this time around, we are discussing three objectives. Yes, um, we're, we're going to call these the three objectives of a historian. Uh, these aren't, I get these from, um, we've mentioned, we've mentioned his name before, and I'll probably mention his name again, uh, from Dr. Uh, w. Morgan Patterson. Um, I'll tell the book at the end of when we give our uh, recommendations. Um, he said that all histor all historians more or less agree with these as the three objectives of of history. Um, I'm not able to find it broadly outside of uh, religious history. Um, uh, hi history of religions work. Um, again, I'm gonna find people who are, materialists and anti-materialists who use this yeah uh, but these three objectives are things that you have to do all three of these things or else you're not really doing history uh you've missed the mark somehow um you're almost there but not quite mm -hmm. uh the first one i would call criticism uh, and these are um, Dr. Patterson's uh, labels for uh, for these objectives, uh, as is the term objective. Uh, 
Um, it also can be called canons of historiography, mm -hmm. uh, which just simply means a measure, right. a measure of whether you've done the job. <laughs> uh, criticism is a, evaluating the explanation of the event known to the intended audience and the um, and the stated cause of the event in your sources. Uh, so it's reading a source carefully, mm -hmm. making sure that it's you are aware of the biases. Uh, everyone has a bias. Everyone has a perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, Adam and I have a, a bias and a perspective. We hope that you, our listener, uh, will come away from this with a deep love of history. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully a Christian perspective of history, and we'll do it that way. Uh, right. So we're in some, some bias. Just because the word bias is being used doesn't mean it's a negative thing. That first... Um, hope that you mentioned for you and I, Johnny Mac, is um, something that anybody could appreciate or get behind, a, a deeper love of history. Who who would say no to that, right? So just because something is technically a bias, or that Jonathan and I refer to it as a bias, doesn't make it something that's wrong, or something that must be um, fixed or, or um, lectured out of you. one of the problems of modern history, and I'm not meaning modern as in contemporary, but of the modern era, mm -hmm. was the there is this assumption during the Enlightenment that we could get out and beyond, um, have sort of a God's eye view of history and know history exactly as it was. Uh, we'll cover... I'm stealing from next week but we <laughs> we need to we need to actually evaluate what is the perspective of the reader that we're looking at uh the other part of bias is um and perspective is that an author has the aims and so just because something isn't mentioned doesn't mean it didn't happen right or it's just not their issue so if there is a a political uh historian who leaves out issues of religion in his history of the ancient world i'm gonna find that a really strange history um but mm -hmm. an ancient historian not mentioning Jesus doesn't mean Jesus didn't exist. It's right. just not in his scope. Right. Right. So now, if this... someone has a negative bias, that is that that can be a problem. But m many times, a bias is something that's either morally neutral, perhaps morally good or simply methodological. So if someone were writing a history of the ancient world, but they were specifically focusing in on uh, the history of ancient China, you shouldn't expect to find Jesus mentioned there. That's, that's a methodolog methodological choice. He's going to study ancient China specifically. Um, I did not mean for us to get off on this tangent on bias, dude. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that's that's the big part of of criticism. That's true. You are I you are identifying the perspectives, positive and negative, mm. of the source material, uh, and evaluating why are they saying this? What's their end? If you don't do this, you haven't really understood the source. Mm. because you're going to, like you're saying, 
um, say, well, why doesn't this source on ancient Chinese history mention Jesus? It's not part of its uh, part of the target. Right. And that's so, kind of a silly example, but but still, I think it communicates but, the point that some biases are, uh, yes, to be understood and, uh, well, always to be understood as you read someone, but not always one to be corrected or railed against. Exactly. Um, sometimes part of this criticism is acknowledging what you have. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The, the second point is the, the second objective is the objective of analogy. Uh, this is trying to connect what's in the world of the original reader mm -hmm. or the world of the event to the current day. <clears throat> uh, so talking to someone in the modern day about uh, travel in the ancient world is gonna be really difficult right because nobody nobody who is an urban dweller has really had the experience of riding on a donkey from uh nazareth to bethlehem <laughs> right <laughs> yeah and on the other hand um we attempt to draw um, analogies that that do work. Um, perhaps race relations in the modern era as an analogy for understanding race relations in North Africa in the in the fourth century, or um, economic conditions. Or there's all kinds of areas. Every area has. Uh, opportunities for analogy as you try to uh, um, study and write history. Um, it's just sometimes more difficult. <laughs> uh, there, there's, a there's a translation of the New Testament. Uh, I'm using translation loosely. <laughs> um, called the Cotton Patch uh, Gospel. Right. Uh, I he wrote, did the rest of the, the Bible as well. Mm -hmm. He's a Baptist. We're Baptists. Uh, this is my world. Uh, <laughs> uh, he tried to put the world of the ancient of of the life and times of Jesus into um, uh, the the American South. Mm -hmm. uh, he compared Jews and Samaritans to racial groups in the American South mm -hmm. uh, as a way to try to make people feel uh, the emotional impact that the original reader would have had right. for the Good Samaritan. Right. Um, a... a a black man doesn't pick up a white guy and take him to the hospital in the civil rights era South. But he does. A, a Samaritan doesn't pick up a wounded man on the side of the... A wounded Jewish man and take him to the hospital down the hill. Right. Uh, not on that road and really not anywhere in that era. So... There's always dangers of analogies breaking down. Sure. And we have to allow for, within our analogy, unique one-time events that never happened before that and will likely never happen again. Mm -hmm. The moon landing would be outside of human experience <laughs> to almost everyone in the world yeah. as history if we ex if our analogies can't deal with unique one-time events yeah uh and thank you dr long for this example
Uh, uh, the third objective is correlation. And this is sort of finally wrapping it all up with a bow. This is identifying specific causes of the event mm -hmm. and all of the causes of the event. How do these events tie together in a cohesive, interesting, readable package? Right. Um, and people are starting to do that right now for the 2016 election. How did we get to this point? What lines can we draw? What, what paths can we follow in order to understand this moment? Exactly. Um, yeah, and that's that's how the history books will be written. Right now, it's mostly just articles. Um, although there's quite a few hot takes out there as well. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, history will focus on not just a moment, like a a book on. We talk about the American Revolution a lot, but it's an easy easy bone to to come back to for you and mm -hmm. I. Um, what uh, what are all the threads? that wove together such that the American Revolution happened. Happened in that way, happened at that time, happened with these people. This is, yeah. would you say that's a good summary, kind of a, a restatement of correlation? Exactly. You, you'd look at the economic factors, the political factors, the mm -hmm. personal factors, uh, and... We shouldn't exclude personal causes out of events of history. Uh, we need to let people be be people. Um, mm -hmm. And we as uh, anti-materialists, uh, we think God is a person. Mm -hmm. uh, we think that he can intervene in the, the events of history. So I'm okay with letting him be an event. At the same time we shouldn't be lazy with the biblical text just as like we shouldn't be lazy with the american revolution and say well the american revolution because god wanted us separated from the evil king george <laughs> well <laughs> god didn't climb on board that boat and throw tea into the boston harbor right god didn't <laughs> hide in trees and then ambush redcoat soldiers whittling down their numbers there are specific reasons for things happening and specific uh modes in which these events happened and so that's correlation it's calling attention to what caused each event in the chain leading to whatever is sort of the focal point the end point of your history mm -hmm. um, so if you're writing a biography of abraham lincoln your end point's generally gonna be uh in ford theater uh mm -hmm. it, it's hard to go much further than that <laughs> well i guess you could do a, a history of what happened to his body <laughs> yeah. after that's actually kind of an interesting story anyway <laughs> I want to hear that, but again, let's leave that for another episode. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to bring us to some books that we would recommend. Uh, again, these aren't books that we would say say everything about this. Um, we like these books. Um, yeah, and, or and these, these books, books aren't necessarily all perfect either, right? Yeah. Like, So, l listener, do you understand that these books are good these books are helpful these books are not perfect we don't uh, just because we recommend them to you doesn't mean we recommend every word every jot and tittle uh so i mentioned the name morgan uh w morgan patterson before right. uh he was our well, our uh, uh academic affairs um and professor of church history for a number of years mm -hmm. he wrote a book called baptist successionism a critical view um his chapter two um lays out how to do this and gives 
example after example of some Baptists not doing this well, um, mm -hmm. missing each of these three. Um, just to, you know, Jesus was perfect. I'm not perfect. <laughs> uh, we Christians, we strive to, to, to be good historians. We fail. It happens. Yeah. Uh, um, he recommends a book, uh, Dr. Patterson, uh, Understanding History by Louis, Louis Gottschalk. Um, it appears to be his source of um, these three. Mm -hmm. um, and tracking, you know, bibliography to bibliography to bibliography. Uh, this all comes from a historian... Uh, by the name of Ernst Trelsch. Uh, he's a German uh, historian of mm -hmm. religion. He wrote an article, Historical and Dogmatic Method in Theology. And that's been reprinted in a book called History in Religion by Fortress Press. And he says what well, we just spent the, uh, the earlier part of this podcast talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to hand it off to Adam, uh, to a more contemporary scholar who's doing this kind of work um, in the while we're doing this podcast. That's right. So we're, whereas Trelsch and the others mentioned um, are historians of uh, generations past, a uh, current historian whose name is John Fia. So that's John, and then his last name is spelled F-E-A, pronounced Fia, is uh, hard at work at a, a Christian university teaching and writing history and writing about history writing. He has two books that directly connect with what Jonathan and I are doing in this particular volume of our podcast. The... The first one uh, Jonathan is more familiar with, and the second one I'm a little more familiar with, um, the first being a book called Confessing History, Explorations in Christian Faith and the Historian's Vocation. Uh, so this book would be a little bit more autobiographical for Dr. Fia, um, but he discusses... Um, what we've been talking about and what we will continue to talk about actually in this volume. Um, Dr. Fia has already taught classes on this very subject, actually, historiography. Uh, um, Dr. Fia is at um, Messiah, um, um, Messiah College. Mm -hmm. um, so he's doing good work. We, we appreciate him as he, helps us understand uh, American history. We think he does a really good job with that. That's right. He has another book uh, that's uh, a little bit more... Um, it's written a little bit more broadly accessible, titled Why Study History? And in that, I mean, the very first chapter is What Do Historians Do? And he, he dives right into everything that um, we have talked about and will continue to talk about. In this in this volume, uh, you can pick that up pretty cheap. It's it's a, about three years old or so. Um, it's not it's not incredibly long. It's not a very uh, lengthy tome. It's um, it's quite accessible. His confessing history, not to get you get people to shy away, uh, <laughs> but it's um, it's written more toward an academic audience and well people who are trying to figure out how to be a Christian historian. Um, and it's a compilation of essays that he has edited. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a, it's a pretty fine work. Very good. Well, Jonathan, anything else you want to talk about uh, for the recommendations before we move on? I think that's what I've got. All right, man. Well, uh, we're nearly done here. On this episode, we want to announce that the next episode of our podcast will release on Friday, December 16th, two weeks from today. In that episode, we will discuss 
what primary and secondary sources are and their role in the work of history writing. If you have any questions, uh, please email us at churchhistorypodcast at gmail.com. That's churchhistorypodcast, with no spaces, at gmail.com. Uh, we'd love to hear from you uh, so that we can make sure that we're we're not just droning on about history, but helping connect with you, the listener. That's right. And uh, something that Jonathan and I are excited about um, is our new companion podcast. If you've missed the announcement from the first two episodes, uh, we'll give it to you real quick right now. But uh, for everyone, as a reminder, this new podcast launches three days after this episode that you're listening to right now goes live. So this episode that you're listening to right now releases on December 2nd. Our new companion podcast releases on Monday, December 5th. It is a weekly podcast coming out every Monday morning. So um, we hope that you subscribe. Uh, you can grab it through. We're going to make sure it gets through iTunes and Podbean and Player FM and Podcast Addict, all kinds of different um, avenues for getting getting subscribed to that. Um, it's a it's for those who haven't heard the announcement before. It's uh, essentially an audiobook kind of podcast. So Jonathan and I will uh, record sermons or uh, letters or essays uh, or even even books uh, divided up into uh, maybe fifteen minute increments, so that each episode is something. Something um, digestible, something you can listen to over a, a commute to work or um, if you're out for a walk uh, or you're hitting the gym, you want to exercise your, your mind as well, uh, you, can, you can subscribe to that and listen to it. We're going to start off with uh, one of the most, to me, one of the most interesting extra-biblical Christian documents from the early centuries of the church. It's a, 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 wor a little work called the Didache, uh, which translates into the teaching or the teaching of the apostles. So this is a, it's going to be a, like a church manual, like how do you do baptisms and how do you do this? And how do you treat uh, visiting um, biblical teachers and whatnot? Uh, it's advice about that from like the second century of, of the church. Like it's pretty cool. Um, we'll be doing, we'll be reading that over the course of two episodes and, and then getting into, uh, lots of other, uh, documents and lots of other kinds of documents after that. So we're pretty excited about this new podcast. If that sounds interesting and helpful to you, uh, please check it out. If you know someone who would be interested in taking a listen, uh, please pass it along so that, uh, other people can be blessed the way that you have. Oh, you know what? We should probably tell them the name. What do you think, Jonathan? Should we let them know? <laughs> yeah, branding <laughs> helps. Uh, we, uh, we... Hey, subscribe, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. Uh, but no, the, the title of the new companion podcast is Saints Gone Before. This is a, a podcast where we try to share from those Christian believers from centuries past uh, what they've written, what they thought, how they prayed, how they worshipped. Um, so our podcast, our new companion podcast, is entitled "Saints Gone Before." Jonathan, you got anything else about that uh, the podcast you're, you're you're wanting to share before we sign off? I'm glad we got the name in, and I <laughs> hope you guys give it a listen. It's going to be fun. Yeah, me too. All right. May God bless you as you go. He's already gone before. Mm -hmm.